Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. People use amateur or ham radio to talk across town, around the world, or even into space, all without the internet or cell phones. It's fun, social, educational, and can be a lifeline during times of need. We'll meet the ham radio group in Cheyenne that has a history that dates back to the 1930s. Ham radio in Wyoming, next on Wyoming Chronicle. Funding for this program was provided by the members of the Wyoming PBS Foundation. Thank you for your support. And as we begin Wyoming Chronicle this evening, we want to learn more about ham radio and ham radio in Wyoming. And we're with Tom Ritter of the Shy Wai Radio Club. Tom, welcome to Wyoming Chronicle. Thank you very much for having us, Kurt. It's a pleasure to be here. We're going to meet other members of your group throughout the show Absolutely. this evening. But Tom, I wanted to start with you. Um, let's go way back in time, almost 110 years ago, when radio technology sure. first started. And let's see if we can learn what ham radio is all about. Absolutely. The art of radio actually started back in the early 1900s with Marconi. And he was the father of wireless uh, telegraphy, which now has evolved into what we know today as amateur radio and the radio field itself, the electronics. Um, the actual uh, radio service itself started uh, in the 1930s. Amateur radio. Amateur radio. Mm -hmm. We actually got started before 1930, but our uh, Cheyenne Radio League started in uh, 1932. And uh, we have grown and developed since then. Technology has got better, and it's basically... Just a radio service that's FCC licensed, and we use allocated frequencies that are not used by other services, such as AM or FM radio or emergency uh, communications. Now, there are three million people in the country that are licensed ham radio operators. That's correct. 2,000 of those are right here in Wyoming. Right here in Wyoming. We have 2,061 amateurs that are licensed right here in the state of Wyoming, but nationwide, um, there's over 700,000. So, so it's, it's 3 million a, worldwide. Then. 3 million worldwide. It's a, it's a very large community, um, and it's growing all the time. We're getting new amateurs into the hobby all the time. And, and I think hobby is a great way to describe what you do, but there's so much to it. Mm -hmm. Why would a person decide to get into ham radio? What, what would they do? Well, in my case, um, I was a youngster. And my dad had a shortwave radio, and I started listening to shortwave radio. And that sparked my interest to get more involved in electronics and communication electronics. Um, a person that is interested in communication electronics and interested in getting into amateur radio, usually that's kind of how they start, being mm -hmm. a listener. And then they go from there. It's not, it's not ultra expensive. Not ultra expensive. You can spend as much money as you want to get as much equipment as you want, um, but you can get into the hobby relatively easy with uh, little money. And the test has evolved over time. It used to be the case where you needed to know Morse code Correct. and some other things. That's not the case anymore. That's not the case anymore. Um, the uh, Federal Communications Commission, which we get our license from, uh, they decided that Morse code really was not a, a great big requirement for the hobby. So I, when I started, yes, I had to know Morse code. And it's a nice mode to know. Um, but you don't have to have that uh, knowledge today when you get your license. So what's involved in, in I decided I want to do this. Sure. And, and I might buy a relatively inexpensive radio, but I've got to get my license. Sure. What's in that process? Is there a kit that you can get that will help you study? And how long does it take? And um, Basically, most hams, when they get started out, they will join a club. And like our uh, amateur radio club here in Cheyenne, they'll join the club and there will be Elmers or trainers. We call them Elmers. 
that will take take an individual that's kind of mentor a mentor and train them. Uh, there's study guides that you can buy from uh, the American Radio Relay League, which is our flagship organization okay. nationally, um, that you can buy to, to do the training, and it'll train you on the various aspects. You get the knowledge, and then we will administer the test. Tom, there are, there are um, clubs all over Wyoming. Laramie, Casper, others. Where, where are the clubs that you're aware of? Um, we have clubs all over the state. Uh, Casper has one. Uh, Cody, Wyoming, has has a, a club. There's the Northeast uh, Wyoming Amateur Radio Club. Um, there is a club over in Gillette, Wyoming, which is our western side of the state. Um, so there's clubs all over the place. They could be large clubs, kind of like uh, the Shiwai Amateur Radio Club. <clears throat> we have about 56 members in our club. Or they could be small clubs, uh, small just due to the population sure. in the area, um, only having 2,000 members in the state of Wyoming, 2,000 active hams spread out over this entire state. Right. So. Now, um, as a hobby, you might be just reaching out to someone all in a different part of the country or a different part in the world, but there are times when ham radio is necessary and is needed in maybe emergency Absolutely. times. Absolutely. Give me an example of that. Um, if you remember the hurricane that went through Puerto Rico a couple years ago, the American Radio Relay League requested 50 amateur radio operators and, and supplied them with equipment to go down to Puerto Rico and set up communications across the island because it had been wiped out. The infrastructure was gone. There was no cell service. There was no, you know, dial up anyway, internet, anything, anything. So what they did was they went down and they set up uh, repeaters, which are radio stations that are portable enough that they can set them up and let the emergency responders utilize those on the amateur radio bands and the hams would operate them and they would provide the communications. They actually provided communications between the first responders and the command post. And then that pool of information was sent via uh, HF radio, high frequency radio, um, back to the states to another control center. And they used that information to find out what they needed. We needed more sandbags over here. They would call out and use the ham network. To All through the that. ham network. Yeah. Also, we use uh, amateur radio for a variety of things, uh, emergency communications, uh, in case we had a local emergency. I mean, we should tell our viewers, we're at the Laramie County Emergency Management Center. Right. This is a ham radio setup that's part of their redundant ability to serve the public. That is correct. And we utilize this station uh, when the need arises that we have an emergency. We need to have somebody at the station to be able to transfer the information from those in the field and the amateurs that are roaming around, say, for a, a severe weather event. Um, we actually have a station here. We have a station down at uh, the National Weather Service that is manned right next to the forecasters so our guys in the field can call on the radio right back to the station. They can report the information directly to the, to the forecasters. So it's used in a variety of, of, of events, um, but it is a, a critical piece that we use to make sure the communications around the city or the state or the county um, is up and available. Why is it that I can, in Cheyenne, with a ham radio, talk to someone in Cody or to someone in Provo or on the East Coast. How does that work? Well, there's a variety of networks that we have set up um, and repeaters that you, you talked about. Um, and one piece that we will talk about uh, here in a little bit is digital mobile radio. That is a new technology that's come about and that enables us to talk across the state um, using networks. And uh, uh, across the country, we can talk on uh, wireless networks also. 
whether it be HF um, or the repeater systems that are around the state. Our repeater systems here, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more in depth, but our repeater systems here in, in Laramie County, we have five or six of them, and they're linked, some of them are linked together, so we can talk between here and <coughs> Torrington or here in uh, up toward Casper. Sure. Um, if we needed to use those systems. And local ham clubs take the responsibility of maintaining those repeaters? That's correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Shy Y Amateur Radio Club maintains all of our repeaters that we have here locally um, using uh, knowledge uh, individuals that are interested in doing the maintenance uh, on those repeaters. Now this is something too that there's no age limit. You can be no. 70 or 80 when you start this or you can be in middle school. That's correct. And we have uh, new amateurs that are coming on board too um, that are teenagers. Um, the uh, Boy Scouts have a radio program. Uh, they call it Jamboree on the Air and they have this every year. Uh, I think we'll hit on that a little bit later. Um, but the youngsters are really where it's all at right now to get them involved in the hobby so that us older guys that have been in the business for a long time, when we're gone, they can pick it up and run and carry it forward. Yep. Well, Tom, we do have more learn to learn about ham radios in Wyoming, but we want to thank you for helping us organize Absolutely. today. We're, we're excited to be here and we're going to continue on with the show. Okay. Sounds good. Thank Craig. you so much. Thank you. And we continue our discussion with members of the Shy Y Radio Club here in Cheyenne with Greg Ricks. Greg, thanks for being with us tonight. Thanks for having me. We want to learn a little bit from you about the different modes people use ham radio to communicate with. Well, Give us a rundown. One of the big benefits of ham radio is that there's so much to do. Um, there's so many different avenues and so many different modes and methods of communication digital, analog. Uh, everybody's familiar with AM and FM in their car radio for entertainment. And of course, Sirius XM, satellite. Amateur radio has all those modes, AM, FM, satellite. Um, and then it goes into the world of analog and digital. You can do both of those things in any of those modes. And as a hobbyist, you can get into as little or as much, right? as you want to. you can. This can take you really wherever you want it to. Correct. Um, there's uh, people that do nothing but on-air activities and running the radio, making contacts, just socializing with a friend or a new acquaintance in Texas or Florida or, or Japan or whatever. And then some other guy simply wants to hook up his computer to a ham radio and talk to another fella via ham radio over a computer, digital communications. The old radio teletype is still around. AM is still around. Um, Earth, moon, Earth. Uh, bouncing signals off the moon. Uh, single side band. Um, trying to... There's so many. Sure. Uh, and, and the diversity of ham radio is the fact that I'm almost never on the air. But I'm a technical person. I built the club's repeaters. Put the stuff on the air. You get a new house, put up a tower. Who's going to climb it and put up the antenna? I will. Uh, I enjoy the building and the, and the construction of the stuff. Then there's guys that just like pencil and paper and figure everything out, uh, the electronics part of it. I go to them guys over coffee and we design so much stuff on napkins at Arby's, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there's so many modes of communication uh, between uh, satellites is finally becoming big in Cheyenne. Uh, our club president is a big satellite enthusiast and portable radio pointing an antenna at the sky, you got to know when and where. That's the secret, when and where to and point that it. information's there. It's, it's all there. on the internet. A lot of guys just use a, a, a tablet and what time, what day, what satellite, what frequency. And the satellite might only be in your vision for two and a half, three and a half minutes, but they can, and there's a footprint of that satellite, of course. International Space Station, you can talk, they usually coordinate with schools, and, which is great to keep the young kids in, in there. Mm -hmm, but, mm -hmm. uh, the modes and, and, and things that you can do in ham radio are just so varied. Your hat, WB7GR. My call sign. And tell everyone what a call sign is. Okay, uh, there's three levels of, uh, right now there's three levels of licensing in the amateur radio community. It used to be 
six, and in 2000, the FCC changed it to three. And the entry level is technician class, and it gives you some frequencies to operate, usually UHF, VHF, and a minor portion of HF or shortwave. And once you become licensed, they issue you a call sign. Systematically, my first call sign was KB7MUP. And that's the one that they doled out. Next one in line. That's what you get. Mm -hmm. Once you receive that, you can apply for what's known as a vanity call sign, which this is a vanity call sign. My initials are in the back of it. Okay. But that's how I identify myself on the air. Everybody has a, a, a call sign and you exchange call signs back and forth. How did you get involved? What's your history with ham radio? Uh, <laughs> uh, I came to F.E. Warren uh, military in 1989. And there were several people in the outfit that were amateur radio. And I was a radio man in the Air Force, uh, ground radio communications, so had some exposure to that. Uh, the other one of our other club members, Tom, actually gave me my novice test back in 1991. And I got it just to leave me alone, I'll get a license. Well, here I am 28 years later, still doing it. So um, that's what it is. It's, it's basically your other name. Awesome. Greg Ricks, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for We're having me. We're going to continue with the other members of the group um, and learn more about ham radio. And we're going to continue learning about ham radio with Greg Gawker. Greg, thank you so much for joining us tonight thank on you. Wyoming Chronicle. This is a, a newer aspect, I would guess you would say, of ham radio that we're going to talk about now. It's a digital Correct. Radio. Yes, it is. Tell me about it. Yes. Um, it is called uh, DMR, or Digital Mobile Radio. Um, it is, uh, it's a system that was built and designed by Motorola. Um, but what it allows us to do is link uh, numerous repeater sites throughout the state of Wyoming uh, over the internet. And that then, in turn, uh, because they are linked, allows us to communicate with other ham operators throughout the state of Wyoming, wherever that repeater might be. You can do text messages. You can do video. You can do GPS data for location. Uh, it's, it's very, very advanced. So uh, there is a worldwide system called the Brandmeister Network. Uh, and we have one of those here in Cheyenne. Uh, the repeater is located at the airport um, and it allows worldwide communications. Um, so with, with a radio that's properly programmed, uh, I could talk to anybody in the world with from a, nothing more than a little handheld or a lot of people call them a walkie talkie um, to anybody in the world. N7GT in Cheyenne. Anybody around for a quick demonstration? WY5 Whiskey Tango Fox. WY5 Whiskey Tango Fox from N7GT. Good evening, Jason. Uh, doing a quick demonstration here for um, a little program that we're filming over here in Wyoming or over here in Cheyenne right now. Uh, and just uh, if you could uh, tell us where you're at and uh, so on, so they kind of get an idea of what the audio sounds like on the DMR system. Hi, sir. Name here is Justin. I'm on the Laramie Tower through the Wyoming DMR network. Uh, actually, mobile right now, driving uh, right through the University of Wyoming. All right. Well, very good, Justin. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And um, drive safe out there while the roads are slick. Is there anybody else around that uh, uh, maybe up north that can uh, jump on and give us a demonstration? This is WY0 Echo Mike Pango in Casper. WA0 EMT from N7GT. Good evening. How's things in Casper? Uh, a little cold. Not too bad. <laughs> I'm on the warm side of the door, meaning I'm inside my house, but I'm. Currently using a A Tone eight six eight handheld radio. Um, by now about five watts or so, and just enjoy a nice quiet evening at home. So what he's what he is using is another handheld, just like this one. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the demo, and uh, we're going to sign off and get back here to uh, to uh, doing the filming. N seven GT Cheyenne. So one thing I'd like to point out in there, Craig, is if you'll notice the clarity of it. It's, it's good. <laughs> that is not only 
what we achieve throughout the state of Wyoming. But that clarity is also what is achieved on DMR worldwide. Much better coverage than cell service. <clears throat> and, and the fortunate thing with cell service, because we do, again, with so much with emergency services, uh, cell phones tend to go down during a disaster, uh, during a tornado or whatever, during severe weather. Um, they tend to go down, and amateur radio won't. Greg Galka, thank you so much for demonstrating for us tonight. We have even more to learn about ham radios in Wyoming, so I really appreciate your time. Sure. Thank you very much. You appreciate it. Thank you. And our final guest as we continue to learn about ham radios in Wyoming is Beth Wood. Mm -hmm. Beth, I first met you at a lecture, I guess, in the Burns Library. Yes. With, your, with the local group, um, kind of informing people on what mm -hmm. the, the club is all about. But you have been involved with ham radio, I guess, since junior high. Yes. How yes. did you become involved? Um, there was a demonstration at the Cary Junior High School. Similar to what I saw then. Exactly. Okay. Um, they were recruiting kids, you know, as another way to get involved um, with the community and, and in a hobby, mm -hmm. you know, extracurricular activities. And um, I got hooked. Nice. And it was in 1993. So I have now been a ham uh, for 26 years. Um, so it's been a while. We were talking with Tom earlier about how hams can be used in an emergency. Mm -hmm. You're the historian for your local group. You're aware of when um, hams were used as an emergency communications apparatus in the 1979 tornado mm -hmm. that was here in Cheyenne and also in the 1985 flood. Yes. Tell us how hams were used then. So um, during the 79 tornado, um, due to the pathway and the destruction, um, the amateur radio operators just came together and that's what we do. We come together in times of emergency and um, helped with the communications um, with the state um, and the local um, uh, public safety mm -hmm. and um, just do what we do. Pass traffic, um, get messages across, um, you know, help, help them coordinate supplies among each other. Uh, in the 1985 flood, um, one of our amateur radio operators was in fact the person that um, spurred all of the warnings and because he recognized the weather and the patterns and things and um, they were up at the weather service um, at their station at the time and uh, were coordinating the, the weather reports that they were seeing across town. So where all the flooding was, um, what uh, uh, the rainfall um, amounts were, things like that. Just, you know, just giving that information to the weather service so they can accurately put out the information as to where the warning should be. Bridging communications gaps when there isn't yes. any other way. And there was a lot of communication that, um, uh, the communication sources that went down during that time just because of, of, of the storm. And so they really pulled together again and did what they needed, what sure. they do. Tell us in a little more detail where we're at now. You're an employee of the Laramie County Emergency Management Association, is that correct? Yes, um, here at the Cheyenne Laramie County Emergency Management Agency, I am the executive assistant. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I now get to tie in my amateur radio experience and my emergency response experience now with, with this agency. Mm -hmm. Tell us about this radio setup here. Why, when might it be used and why is it needed? Um, this might be used for larger events, um, either statewide or nationwide. Um, in, you know, we hope we never have to activate it for that, um, but it is a backup system. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in larger national events like, like a hurricane, um, if we needed to um, pass traffic or messages um, to, uh, to other agencies, we can do that if we're activated here. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that we always are. But, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And some some other counties also have similar equipment. Is that accurate? Um, yes, they do. And so it's it goes with the same thing. Um, uh, you know, with this type of equipment, we may not do um, county to county. We would use our DMR mm -hmm. um, system uh, that I believe Greg talked about mm -hmm. um, more than this would mm -hmm. be because this is more for long distance. And can you share with me, what's the um, relationship with Homeland Security that an agency like yours might have? Um, so we are under Wyoming Office of Homeland Security. Um, so we work uh, quite a bit with them and coordinate resources um, uh, with them if we need them statewide mm -hmm. and things. Um, some of the stuff that we will 
coordinate through them with our amateur radio operators is if there's flooding in other areas of the state. Um, then they will, you know, contact us and see if we have any resources. And one of those is always the amateur radio operators, and they're always more than willing to go up to wherever they're needed and help out during the flooding. Um, we had that in the Lusk flood, um, Saratoga flood mm -hmm. flooding over over the past. Again, we want to um, tell folks that this is a, something that almost anyone can get involved with. Most certainly. What encouragement would you give someone who's watching right now who, this might be something that I want to learn more about? So amateur radio is a hobby, first and foremost. And we're talking, especially with my agency, we talk about emergency communications, and it's so much more than that. Um, it encompasses such a wide range of topics that um, anything and everything that you might want to get into could be tied to ham, ham radio. I mean, if you're interested in the legislative side of it, there's plenty of opportunity to get involved. If you like building radios, more on the technical side, you can do that. If you like teaching, which is what I like to do, um, you can do that and stuff. So there's always something for somebody in this hobby. It's really great. <clears throat> Beth, I appreciate your time. This is the second opportunity I've had a chance to visit with you about ham radios, and you've been very gracious. So well, thank you. Thank you for joining us on Wyoming Chronicle. Thank you for having me. Funding for this program was provided by the members of the Wyoming PBS Foundation, thank you for your support.